All right, we are live. I cut it off halfway through, and well, Hans thought he had another three minutes. There he is. Welcome, Julia. Although you are a muted, sister. Good day. Good day. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Greetings and salutations, friends, Romans, countrymen. And people from all over this plane, we're going to try to explain what's going on or figure out what's lying beneath tonight with some caves and hidden layers of the earth. <laughs> right? Hans has been in the Osiris shaft. You've been in South America in on, on oh god, I can't even say it. Owante Tambo. Is that how it's Oante Tambo, yeah. And uh, also Nepal, where there's a, a vast system of, of caves as well. So, and very, then, very, very amazing stuff. <laughs> and you're headed to Mexico soon. Yeah. So, uh, on the 27th to the 31st of this month, I uh, will be joining the Templar Tours group with my good friends uh, and fellow esoteric researchers, Grandmaster of the Knights Templar, Timothy Hogan, and Johnny Enoch. And we will be discussing Mayan mysteries uh, around culture and civilization, um, trying to connect their past with ancient Egypt as well as ancient China. And there's a lot of compelling evidence there, as well as their connection with the Templars around uh, 1200 um, AD or Common Era. And so we all thought Christopher Cristobal de Colon discovered America. Ah. Anyway. <laughs> Far from long, long, far from it. Exactly. I mean, so yeah, no. So it's going to be an amazing tour. Uh, it's basically three intense days, and then you know, travel there, travel back. We'll all be lecturing about something. I'm going to be connecting a lot of the dots between Egypt and the ancient Mayan culture because there's definitely a connection there, as well as Egypt and Peru. Speaking of caves and cave systems, uh, yeah, it's been I'm some sad. new amazing caves found in mexico haven't there julia yes and what i found so interesting immediately i was like that looks like a greek god or and that looks like you know a, apollo so that's why i thought it would be appropriate to show everyone this and just an fyi i don't know how to turn off my messenger and so if anything pops up you guys are just gonna have to deal with it but okay let me play it and yes, yeah, so this is a video just posted by Sibs on Instagram of some supposed new Mexican tunnel, but it literally shows Olmec, what looks like Greek, what looks like possibly some Egyptian, and definitely Aztec and Mayan. And, it's and by the way, if you guys aren't following Sibs, it stands for Seeing is Believing. He's got amazing stuff, his Instagram um, Facebook, and he does have a YouTube channel. Um, we're going to be doing a show uh soon but so check out sib stuff but yeah this is from sibs also to mention that this is it seems like it's buried in mud which is you know more of the interest around mud floods so. right like just look at that is that a face uh, in the in the stomach yeah i saw that yeah let me well. let me rewind that hold on Definitely a face. Look at that. Yeah. Please troll it. And like. and holding the belly, similar to what you see at Gobekli Tepe and Easter Island and other other sites around the world. The, the holding of the belly. That's interesting. That almost looks like bone that is carved. That's crazy. But it could just be the flashlight angle. Right? Another person carved. In I'm curious. Belly. I'm curious what what type of bedrock this is if it's limestone or if it's something harder but yeah as you can see the the, the this character here is buried in mud it's it's crazy what is going on there and has wings like angelic wings it seems very mercurial and, uh, like mm. and the mud like so much mud how did it get into these cave systems like literally it looks like it's halfway up in mud probably doesn't that look Greek or Roman? Like it definitely does. Doesn't look Mexican, that's for sure. It's wearing some sort of headgear. The eyes are very, yeah, Greco. Interesting. Is that an angel? Bring me an angel. Hopefully, <laughs> angel, not vampire or. Oh, here we have. Here we have. 
I wish you'd pan back on this, but it's like a um, six pointed star. And in it is an upside down face. And on top of the upside down face is another face. I don't know if you saw that when you went by. You want to rewind it? Yeah, You'll please do. This, please. Apparently, this video is somewhere on YouTube. If you have the link, please post it because we're so, currently stuck to stupid meta and it's <laughs> size. It pans to the left here, and there's this like, you know, tetrahedron star of David, not tetrahedron, uh, hex hexagram star of David, or um, Solomon's sigil of all things. It, it definitely gets a whole nother vibe coming up because it seems to take a little bit of a darker turn here towards the end. Right. Well, now it looks like it's getting. And this looks that Olmec as yeah in style, but also a Medusa coming up too. And what is that? Yeah, that's six. One, two, three, four. The eight pointed star. Eight, eight pointed star with the with the Templar cross in the middle of it. Interesting. The goddess worship. Very, we need to bring it back. This is, oh, you see that? It's just wild. Like, need to find this place need to visit this place wonder if it's montezuma montezuma or maybe around tula possibly close to where everything mike's artifacts there are some similarities between well, this and a, little, a little bit so yeah this is the medusa that we were talking about earlier i think you passed by the star already but um is that an owl yeah. What is oh, that? It's like a, beard, a bearded individual. So this is like the, the Quetzalcoatl or, you know, Kukulakan character. Is this <laughs> well, it's interesting because, you know, the feathered serpent, right? So what was Medusa? She was a nog. Oh, well, there's another serpent. face in that, in that pyramid. In the, right. That reminds me of uh, what is it? Uh, the Kara, the one by Gebeki Tepe, Karahan with the face. Yeah, Karen oh, Kar Karen, Karen Tepe. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting that Tepe keeps coming up um, to you know to the to the Turkish. They think it means you know like hill or pot bellied mound or something along these lines. That was what Gebeki Tepe meant was pot bellied hell. Ill, not hell. <laughs> but then you have this time of the commissions, you know, that, that goes way back beyond the, you know, pre-dynastic Egypt and the old kingdoms and the pre-dynasties. And they have this time that they called Zep Tepi, which is the, the beginning times when they claim that the gods, you know, walked, walked on earth with us. And so these are the myths of Osiris and, you know, Athor and Horus. Unfortunately, these are all the Greek names <laughs> of the Whoa. netters or the aspects of nature. Did you see that this face? Is... Well, let me yes, back. Super, super fascinating. Right? There's so many, and each one you is see like to the in right the back. Of the tongue yeah, out, yeah. With the tongue out. It's got that like uh, in India. Oh, it does. Yeah, yeah. The, the Kali almost. Literally representing cultures and people from everywhere in the world carved into this cave system. And so we have to we have to admit that the seas were not barriers, the seas were highways. And this is this is huge. Oh, but we came across oh, the land bridge. Mud. Look at that mud. What on earth? Oh, there's what another is mouth. That? Right? Like fish creature, eel or something coming out of there. Another, Another face that looks like an elongated skulls. Skull. Yeah, interesting. There's a skull on the left there, and like it looks like there was mud all the way to the roof. And has this been excavated out?
very, you think there'd be a little, little bit more mud on the artifacts, but if it's been excavated out, they've been washing them down and some sense. Yeah. I noticed you commented the other day when I was bringing up the um, pools of mercury beneath. So it's like, you know, was were these used for like a, you know, particle it's beam like accelerator? <laughs> or the, like, well, the, 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 I can't remember what, it's like the first emperor of China where the pyramids um, in China are, he buried himself in a lake of mercury. And they know this because they've done like ground, ground penetrating surveys and there's like mercury vapors coming off the ground. And mercury is interesting because if you add electricity to it, it becomes a plasma. And so uh, even in the experiments with the bell and um, Walter Bosley, another person you've had on the channel there, Bernie. Actually, I was about to bring up, I was checking my emails. I replied to Walter. He said uh, Thursdays are best. So maybe next Thursday or the following Thursday we will be the doing. following Thursday so I might be in uh, Mexico. <laughs> well, what a perfect spot to join us from. Uh, yeah, if I can figure that one out, sure. <laughs> no, that would actually be amazing. Hopefully not uh, kidnapped by the cartel and uh, asking for ransom. We get do not, a do not, do not, do not say that, my friend. <laughs> do not put that into the universe. <laughs> no projecting. This, this no look projecting. at the look at this one, you guys. Right, it's almost it's very Peruvian, oh almost. Gosh. Yeah. The helmet's almost Roman esque giant nose. That I too. Think. But the, the headdress seems very um, South American. There's a lot of that. Where is. Wow. This is just intense. We must find this place. There's all these upside down. I mean, this almost reminds me of. The artwork in the labyrinth. In yeah, well, way. this right here, you guys. What? <laughs> what? In it's a breasted tea. bat with with the or Egyptian king Egypt, king's but... headdress. What sort of anthropomorphic goddess do we have here? And it has wings. Uh, looks like it, or that could be hair. Fin? Oh yeah, hair. Yes. And the heart next to it, so with 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 the blade piercing the heart. That's interesting. If somebody could tell me how to log out in Facebook Messenger on this thing, <laughs> you just uh, go ahead and tell me. It gets so bad, like because then all these messages pop means. up, and then they they think that I read it. Oh gosh, I just want to disable that. If you're trying to chat with Julia, she's sorry she's currently in a live stream. She's not ignoring. Sorry, closed for business. <laughs> but like the faces on each corner too. It's they're, like, they're, they're vastly different and it's, it's yeah. almost as if the further you go into this, it's telling a different story. Um, similar to what you know the, the the tarot would do, you go through the different phases of the tarot. You start as the fool, the beginning of the cave, and so here's another one of the six pointed stars. You know the the uh, hexagram, the circular figure in the middle looks What's like that it's on the a, bottom. Oh, Was that it's one? Like two, how three, the how the natives do the do the wings. You see a lot of this yeah. glyph up here in the Pacific Northwest a lot. Um, not with the six-pointed star in the middle, but uh, very similar to this, this style of um, badge with with. Feathers. I wonder if it's like calling in the elements, all yeah, the elements. Um, that could be. Yes, like alchemical. Well, there's there's that cave in. Um, Another way. Oh, God, is it? It's in. What I believe it's in England. No, but, but seriously, when you go that's... into it, what? This are they right here. stars or? This thing on the side. Doesn't that look like a middle finger? Middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of Rick and Morty. Remember how he, he goes uh, when they go to visit his brake light and he gets off of like and he has two middle fingers and the, everybody's flipping him off. He's like, that's how I taught them how to say hello. <laughs> what is that, though? Right here next to the arm. 
Oh, it looks like it's if you go to the left, I wish the camera would go to the left. It looks like it's part of the headgear of this thing because there's the same motifs on the other oh, side. Oh yeah. Good call. So it's something that has its hands up and there's like these big earring pieces. Yeah, you can see that. Plugs. Yeah. Oh, interesting. The bee motif. Very interesting. Was it a bee? Butterfly, bee, moth. Actually, it looks like a moth. So, hmm. looks a little bit like an owl. It's got some cute lips. <laughs> it did. <laughs> I see a lot of similarities with Mike's collection of artifacts. S similar. I'm just similar. waiting for the for the for the Banksy autograph in the corner. <laughs> so right? So you notice to Hans when they like when you go into these tunnels and stuff or like they present it like a story as you're walking in. That this is what it seems to me. You know, it's like each corner has a different element or aspect, but I I feel Bernie, yeah, Bernie I feel like a, it's like in Bernie, deep, like Bernie section a, elemental. Yeah, Bernie had a had a good thought on that as well. And so Oh, hello. Right, like still digging, excavating out. How deep There's are that with the tongue? Are we like, only hey guys? The maybe an actual beady shows up, an actual being shows up and makes that face. Right, like well, how many cultures do we see? You know, the 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 tongue in uh, quite many. So, like that. <laughs> This was just profound to me, this right here, with, because of looking like that and that type in Mexico, I thought that was profound. Okay, that was it. Hmm. Oh, thanks for sharing. Wow. That's... Thank you. Yes, like this, we have to find more info on that. And I look forward to your interview with Sibs, Julia, where you can hopefully find out more on that because just it's profound and like I can't help but feel that it's the similar case to the Moai in Easter Island where we just see the heads because the bodies are buried and was all of that mud below burying the bodies and Bernie did you get that video I sent you about um Easter Island like how they got burned like they torched yeah yeah, the Billy Carson clip where he was talking about it. Hey, that's I got to look into that. Yeah. What's this? I sent this clip to Bernie because uh, it was Billy Carson saying that Easter Island was torched. And he like he was saying like how hard it is to get to Easter Island. He's been trying for years. And then how somebody went there with like a bunch of fuel. And he's like, how would it even get it, get the fuel there? Cargo plane ship. But like <laughs> what like and torched it. <laughs> yeah, he was saying apparently a bunch of the Moyai were destroyed by a fire. It was, it was weird. Got a, definitely that doesn't make sense because they're they're volcanic rock. It's gonna take quite a bit of heat exactly. to melt. Exactly. Like that, that was part of the claims is that they had to be, <laughs> it was actual jet fuel. My fuel. my on them my, to actually destroy them and burn so hot it was quite strange i'm i'm curious if they're doing slash and burn agriculture because the agriculture on easter island is very poor and so if you burn what's there you create more nitrogen in the soil um they do this in nepal they'll they'll do slash and burn agriculture um, in the village groups but uh, unfortunately as the villages keep expanding and expanding they keep cutting into the sacred forests and yeah, creating more and more problems. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, that was fascinating. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Um, that was perfect for your upcoming trip. 
Yeah, I need to. I'm, I'm excited to see some of the cenotes down there because these are also cave systems that are totally yeah, filled with water. Are. And recently they've explored a few of them and they've gone on for two, 300 miles, <laughs> you know, through really? these caving systems. Well, what I like to look at it as like a lot of water worshiping going on at a lot of these places. If like, and that's programming the water, things that you do there, how you can affect it, water worship. I have a weird feeling that when a lot of these caves are being occupied, now that they're underwater, was when the water level was was vastly different. Right, and it seems like a lot of them have carvings and had life in them, and like, what were yeah. these giant underground systems, and were they inhabited, were they man-made, intelligently made, giants made, possibly, uh, from that time of pre-cataclysm and the megafauna? Were they used as, you know, an initiation going through Shabalaba or as in Egypt, they go through the Duat, you know, to, to have this initiation. And they'll do this at sites like uh, Koma Bo, which is um, about halfway down the Nile from, from uh, Luxor on the way to Aswan. And Koma Bo is the, the temple of the crocodile um, netter, basically. And so it's the Temple of Crocodiles, and there's this cave system that the initiates would go down into, and they would have to swim through the crocodile den and immerse from the other side without obviously being attacked by the crocodiles. Well, the crocodiles only eat, you know, specific, they don't eat a lot, and they eat specific times of year, but the initiates don't know this. And so they're swimming through this this pit of crocodiles underneath the temple, and it's you can see where the pit goes in and you can see where it comes back out. And what's fascinating about this temple is on the back wall, you have all the inscriptions of Imhotep, who was a, he was an architect. He was a, a medical physician. He was a scientist. He was an alchemist. And on the wall is like all the tools used for dentistry that we use today, all the tools used for surgery that we use today, you know, engraved on the wall with the depictions of what they do, how to use them, these kind of things. And it's, it's, it's a fascinating sight, for sure. Where's this? This is Mount Yamnuska. And uh, shout out to my good friends, brothers uh, Cody and TJ to catch. Uh, I was with them uh, spreading their mom's ashes, actually. We were hiking this mountain when my dog stumbled across this and found this. And it's actually a cave underneath behind it. And I'm going to zoom up. It straight up looks like a megalithic site, and it kind of looks like a reptile head placed on the top of it. Up here, you can see with teeth, eyes carved in, uh, quite wild. But how far back does this cave system go? We how, have... how big is that that we're looking at? What What is the height of that? Oh, that's you know. got to be between 30 to 60 feet. Wow, shoots, height. that's huge. Okay. Oh, yeah, absolutely huge. Each one Interesting. Of these and it's crazy because it's like each one of these blocks looks like it's stacked upon each other, and then you have a white head placed upon all the darker uh, body pieces. Not the best picture of it. I got to go back with the drone, but it's... Quite wild, it's actually right on top of a cliff face that goes quite, quite far down. So you haven't actually been in the cave, you just you stumbled upon it and went, oh my goodness. I, <laughs> I got up to like right where the uh, hand marker is, and it's like, that's about six feet tall, but it's all, you can only like crawl on your hands and knees about three feet into the back behind the structure, and we got spooked to the heck out of there both like my dog and like me and my buddy cody at the same time like this like i don't know gust of wind came out from it and like it just we felt like something was back there and that's what drones are for right you know the drones can explore the caves that have reptile heads guarding them this reminds me of a cave actually above cusco beneath uh sexy woman and so you you wind your way up the road to this cave, and they've 
cut like a water trough into it but when you walk into this cave you can see all the tool marks and it's it's like somebody was in there with a machine just you know hacking away at everything in this cave and they made a place for somebody to sit there's an altar you can climb up into the back side of the cave it's it's a very fascinating spot So you can see right there that it can fit in there and it does go back behind and we have every intent to go see if there's anything carved in there and behind it. Oh. And me and my dog hiking Yamniska. Happy dog, happy dog. There we go. But not in that album, the another album on the backside of uh, where that reptile guy is, is um, where the other mountain cliff face with the giant guardians that look like bears and stuff are. Hmm. And its relevance being uh, the Montana Megalis and how close we are to Montana in southern Alberta where I am. And is it just a continuation and extension of these giant, giant remnants? Wow, go back up, actually, that dolmen. That's really interesting. Right? It's really fast. It reminds me of that spot we were talking earlier in, in the Ural Mountains, very similar size. Exactly. Stone. Very, very parallel uh, yeah. styles of these megaliths and sizes. Of them. And this one, you can see this is like uh, the Eagle Mount Amphitheater, and it's literally got like the eagle head, the wings. And, Even the legs, uh, yeah. Coming out. And that it actually is a perfect amphitheater from when you stand up here and yell. It's it's literally an amphitheater. Speaking of eagles, uh, it's it's interesting. We actually now have an eagle in my neighborhood, <laughs> which is weird. We have a lot of hawks and coyotes that come through. I've never seen an eagle, and it it it's found a perch and it flies over the freeway all the time and. Like this is in the middle of the city. What is an eagle doing in the middle of the city? <laughs> yeah, it Coming doesn't make sense. It's for you. Kind of, yeah. Well, obviously. I mean, you see them all over Alaska. That was the most amazing thing. You, you're driving from Juneau uh, up the up the road, and they have the eagle perches all the way up the road. And there's so many eagles. It's so beautiful. Eagles are really beautiful creatures. They truly are majestic animals, as are owls. I had an owl. I was about to say that, owls as well, yeah. I literally kid you not, I finished the stream like a week and a half ago, and I was like right outside my mom's, and I was like, oh, I got to invite Julia to the next Blake stream. She has her and owl. My yeah. owl literally flew by, and I was like, the fuck? Are you serious? Are you messing with me? I'm not messing with you. This actually happened. But right after you thought about me? Yeah, right after I thought, like, it was right after I'd finished that first stream with Blake and Zertis, like, 10 days ago or something. Anyways, yeah, it was, it was crazy. It's Oh, yeah. my gosh. Yeah, yeah, my sister, like, yeah, my sister saw one, like, right on her way to come to me and was like, okay, I guess I'm supposed to go. <laughs> I guess I'm going to see Julia. That's so weird. Right? Like, you are the white owl. <laughs> That's, it's, the white owl is the most interesting on my granddad's property in Vancouver, Washington. He's right, right down on the Columbia River. A 13 acre property, beautiful, couple, couple of forests in there as well, and on the property. And when I was a kid, or younger, you know, I was a teenager, basically, we would always do, like, campouts on the lawn when I'd come home from Nepal for summer vacations. And I'm hanging, you know, hanging out with my cousins and whatnot. And this white owl would always swoop down and perch above the front door. And so we're like, what is going on? And so one day we followed it back up into what we called the fairy forest. There were two, two forests, but one was above the house. And some random things happened in there. Trees would fall without making noises and so on and so forth. And my grandmother's grave is in that forest. 
and the owl would perch near her grave as well. And so we thought, huh, maybe this is, you know, spirit of grandma coming coming to to give lessons. But oh yeah, definitely. The white I mean, owl is very fascinating. Yeah. Actually, my friends uh, sync uh, with uh, Cody and TJ to catch those just talking about and they're mo releasing their mom's ashes on that mountain, literally on that top uh, hike up. We talked about how anytime their mom comes to talk to them or see them, she appears as a hummingbird. And we had a hummingbird <laughs> like literally appear uh, right in front of us uh, as they said that. It's, uh, it's, it's a real thing. Definitely. Yeah, okay. Shout out to my friend Nick. <laughs> when his mother passed, he had dreams of peacocks and tigers. And so in 2005, I believe it was. Yeah, I think it was. No, 2000. I think it was 2005. He, on his way, he had vacation. He lives in Austria and he was like, oh, I'm going to go visit Nepal. And, you know, you're, you're going to be there in September. I'm going to come visit. So he came and landed in Nepal like a day before I did. And Kathmandu is crazy. I mean, <laughs> you're driving down, you know, a two lane road and it's basically five lanes of traffic, even though it's a two lane road. <laughs> and everybody's going, you know, 50, 60 kilometers an hour. And it's just, it's, it's crazy night in your time. And you take your life into your hands <laughs> driving in Nepal. Anyway, and so we decided at the end of the trip that we we're going to go to Chitwan, and Chitwan is down in the jungle. Um, I have a friend that runs um, a couple of resorts down there, Tiger Tops, Machan, and uh, Temple Tiger. And so we ended up going to Temple Tiger, which is in the in the wildlife preserve. They don't allow these parks or these uh, resorts in the wildlife preserve anymore, sadly. So they're all now outside of the, the park, and then you go into the park. But while you're there, you know, you do elephant rides and you walk around on the elephant like from eight to, to noon and then you come back and do lunch and then there's like bird seeing and you go out and check out deer. But the elephant rides are pretty cool because when you're on the elephant, you're, you're around the rhinoceros. But you don't really ever see tigers and you really don't ever, it's fascinating, you don't really ever see um, uh, leopards either. And I've, I've seen a few leopards in the wild after they've gotten a fresh kill, they'll be up in a tree eating a chital or access deer. You don't ever see the tigers because by eight o'clock in the morning, they're asleep. They've, they've, they're not, they're very nocturnal and they hunt at night. And so our last night there, I'm sick as a dog. Um, food poisoning, too much MSG. I don't know what it was. I was, I could not hold anything down. And so we went to bed early. We had to get up at 4.30 in the morning to get on the the, uh, the Jeep to take us to the roadhead to meet the bus. It was like a three-hour drive to the roadhead where the bus was to take us back to Kathmandu. It's like a seven-hour bus ride from Chitwan, even though, the, you know, by by way the crow flies, it's 100 miles, you know? <laughs> it's just like all these windy roads. Anyway, and so I'm, I'm sick as a dog. I, I grabbed as many bananas as I could in the morning. All night long, we were kept up because you could hear that there was a tiger circling the camp, and the elephants were freaking out all night. And so, in the mm. morning, in the morning, where I grabbed all the bananas I could just to have like a stabilized stomach of sorts. And so, we're driving in the jeep. It had rained all night. We're coming down the hill and sliding through the mud and the jeep track. We come down to the elephant grass, and we call it elephant grass. We also call it elegant grass because it's it's about you know. 10, 10 feet tall and it's razor. I mean, you'll cut yourself to the bone with the, I mean, it's, yeah, it's like razor grass. It's crazy. I know what you're talking about. That stuff is wild. And uh, we're, we're driving up the path and the driver stops dead in his track. And I'm, I'm literally about to puke out the back of the Jeep. My friend, Nick, he grabs my shoulder. He's like, he's like, Hans, Hans, stop, be quiet. Turn around. And I turned around and this young Tigress, young tiger female, crossed in front of the Jeep about three feet, turned and looked at us, and then went back into the elephant grass on the other side and, and moved on. And he said, I, I'm, I'm seeing my mother. I'm having this experience with my mother because this is what I dreamt when, I, when she died. It was about peacocks and, and tigers, and I'm actually seeing this tiger. I'm like, Nick, I've been to Chitwan 16 times in my life, and I have never seen a tiger, ever. You are a very, very, very lucky person that this has happened. 
So yeah, <laughs> there's magic to that, man. There's magic in those messages. So animal spirit is very, very strong. I remember the thought that I had that was like, I wonder if like imagine birds having like like omens, like is like like they have schedules yeah. of like, oh, gotta go over and swing, <laughs> swing on by and you know, this person at eleven, oh, I have three o'clock, gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> gotta go to this like city for uh, Devin. I gotta go show Devin. Gotta go fly by real quick. What What is the stork a representation? I was about of? to I mean, say the stork's yeah. delivering babies. What are the owls doing? What are the owls doing? Oh They're delivering messages like in Harry Potter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but of that world of like, I thought of. I remember coming up with like, oh, that'd be a good idea for like a Disney Pixar movie of like. Where the birds huddle, they're like, "All right, they like re they review." They say a crow remembers your face like for life for the rest of your oh, life. God. Of like them gathering and being yeah. like, "All right, all right, uh, Johnny's gonna walk down there around three. You see what that guy did last week? You know he was uh, literally he did this. All right, car. everyone, let's go." <laughs> and like poo, you know, like just birds being like that. And like I was thinking of all these different funny concepts of how they operate. <laughs> Oh. They, they, they. That's there's truth in that, and it's it's weird. I haven't seen a lot of crows in Portland, but recently, in like the last two years, they do what they did in Nepal, and they'll all fly west or yeah, west as the sun is setting. And in Nepal, at like a certain time of day, they all take off and they all fly west, and so the sky will just be littered with crows. And then, if you're down in like Tamil area, there's a tree that has the vampire bats in it, and these bats are massive i mean they're huge and they will do the same thing at a certain time of day they will all take off and you just get like this black sky of, of bats and uh i have a outdoor cat and uh the crows come and eat her food and it's 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 so random because they'll just be sitting out there and the cat's sitting in the chair looking at the crow a foot away you know well, i'm not really gonna mess with you but you can have my food and the crow will be trying to eat the cat's food and even going after the wet cat food, it's really weird. And so, yeah, they're they're really smart, very smart animals, crows are. But they definitely remember you because you come out and, and try and shoo them away and they'll they'll come back with vengeance. Oh, I love uh, that Nepal, story. In Nepal, again, yeah, at Fort Durbar, there's a tree full of crows and you never wanted to park under it and never piss those crows off because... You may have had a blue or black car uh, when you pulled into Fort Durbar, but uh, your car is now white. <laughs> oh, Bernie, uh, not I just love that, it. but go go it's back out. Scoot. The sovereign cosmic wind wisdom, wind right. wild man. Wind. Sorry, getting that. Uh, zoom, 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 zoom back out. Chat. Can oh, you zoom please. back out on that? Go, yeah. go backward. Keep going back. Keep going back. Keep coming back. So if you look at the wall on the left, there's like a half circle. Yeah. I see that. Going all the and way. It goes all the all the way into the head. That's really yeah. interesting. It's a vein, it's a vein of something, a different oh, crystalline mass. Where is this? It's overlooking a piece of water. Uh, sovereign cosmic wild man. Where uh do you mind sharing where you got this? Where you filmed it? Where you found it? Well, where are we looking? He's in my chat. Um, where is this from? Obviously, that pyramid behind it is a lot closer than the <laughs> period of Mankari <laughs> at, the, at the Giza Plateau. But <laughs> the the SoCal, SoCal, Southern California. Really interesting. There's an it's obelisk almost, nearby. Yeah, it's almost it's almost like calmly or basalt in a sense or a, a men here or an obelisk yeah interesting dude i'm telling you they're charging the water i i that doesn't that surprise all. me at all just based off of the remote viewing sessions i've what i've come across and applying that and being i that's just what i have to say All right, share that in the live chat for everybody. Great work, great find. That's what it's all about finding it near you. So, yeah, 
wish I had the photos. Kathmandu is littered with a bunch of cave systems as well. So you have this valley. And the hills around the valley are like 15,000 foot. And then the mountains are even higher than that. Uh, the hills aren't that high, obviously, but it seems like they're they're incredibly high. Kathmandu Valley is at 4,700 feet. And it used to be a lake. And so there's a saying that the god Chobar took his great sword and he cut the gorge of Chobar Gorge and drained the lake. And there are so many cave systems that go in and out of Kathmandu Valley. And historically, they were used to raid and overthrow the Shahs. The, the Ranas came in and overthrew the Shahs through the tunnel systems and totally took the Shahs by surprise because they didn't know where these caves came out. Uh, there's the silver door at Swayambunath, which apparently goes into another caving system that holds lots of ancient Buddhist relics. Um, there's a Shiva cave in Chobar. I've been up into that one. And you go Ooh. back quite a ways, and you, you start running into these yogis that are sitting there meditating, these sadhus that are in this cave. And the walls are all adorned with art, but it's it's all like Shiva-related. And this is, this is part of the Chobar Gorge uh, cave system. Um, and then when they were building some of Kathmandu and redoing redoing the U.S. Embassy and some of the other areas around um, Maha, um, oh, why can't I think of the name of the, of the, the neighborhood? Um, it's, it's on the north eastern side of the valley. Uh, it's, it's north of Tamal, um, but they just, they they discovered a whole bunch of cave systems already under the system under the city when they were trying to dig out the new sewer system and all these old cave systems were old temples so there are all these old temple structures underneath the city in these caves right like and then why you get into are there underground cities and cave systems literally underneath everywhere everywhere, everywhere. every city every area of the world and they're always usually guarded by monks and like <sighs> This so year. going going to Pokhara, to Fewatal, the Feywatal, the sacred lake, Feywatal was made geologically in a matter of minutes. There's a massive landslide that came off the mountains and it, it blockaded this river system and created this massive lake. And so there's all these underground caves underneath the lake. And so I was there, what was it, 96, my friend's graduation. We went for spring break. Uh, it would have been 98. So we went for a spring break. And we decided they they all decided to go to to Farewell Tall. My my good friend, <laughs> Mister G. We would go into the casinos and he'd take the back page of the in flight magazine and he'd get five hundred Indian currency. And he was a master card counter. And so we'd sit at the blackjack table, and he would make six seven hundred dollars off of free money. And then they bring in the pontoon dealer. They realized his gimmick that he was counting cards because they're they're using like a three a three deck boot. You know, it's really easy to count cards in a three deck boot. <laughs> And so he he just mastered the game, and so that would be our spring break money. And so I went with his senior class when I was working there to Pokhara, and we had an epic adventure. And we all decided the second day we were there, we were going to go into the Shiva cave system underneath Fewatal, which is called Davies Falls, and it's under Davies Falls. And it's called Davies Falls because a tourist in the seventies decided to she she fell in the water system and got swept away and went over the falls into this cave structure. The falls goes into a cave, and you you don't see it for many miles where it comes out as the river and so the lake drains into this and they put a dam there's a dam to the north of this and if there's too much rain in the monsoon season which is you know starts around may they they open the dam to release more water and there's a shiva temple in the cave structures underneath the dam or underneath davies falls and so you go to the tibetan camp and you got to obviously pay somebody a little bit of a bribe so that they don't really tell anybody that you're there. And they'll take you into the cave structure and you go by the Shiva cave section. It's you basically would take a left and go up. And so it's above where the damn water would flow through. But we went all the way underneath where Davis Falls comes through and have these amazing photos of just, you know, pinpoint of light and the water coming down. And we were all paranoid because we thought they were up in the dam while we were down there. <laughs> But these these caves are all over this area of Nepal, and so it's it's like such a fascinating scenario because you find almost the same thing when you're in Peru. You find these cave structures everywhere; they're everywhere. 
And in Cusco, they won't let you into the cave structures at all because people have gone in and have never come out. It's like, well, you know, with today's G well, even GPS wouldn't work underground. You'd have to use like, you know, the, the bread breadcrumb trail or, or the miles of string. It's a little hard kind of when scenario. you're in an under mountain river though, right? Like, like for sure no and that's 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 where things you know become very fascinating it's like well how far do those cave systems neon go? green rope <laughs> so the other cave systems in nepal are up in dolpo and uh, mustang and these are way up on cliff sides and even when you go up to manang and you go up into the old like shale fortresses where you can you know you have a perfect uh bow and arrow view of the valley where you can take out anybody coming into it across the valley Above the river systems are all these caves dug into the hillsides, and this is where the Buddhists had, you know, manuscripts and and other artifacts as well as as wall drawings. But in Dolpo and Mustang, these caves are dated, you know, fourteen, fifteen thousand BC when they were occupied, and they found Buddhist, you know, artifacts in there. They found manuscripts. They like lots of scrolls and manuscripts, obviously for more modern times but the occupation of this cave is interesting and the only way that you can get into these caves is to repel from the cliff side above and go down to them and so it beggars the question you're looking at this very dry arid tibet plateau where you're looking over from nepal and dopo and mustang area and it, it beggars the question if this area was occupied by water at some point because we know the Himalayas, you know, people, everybody's like, oh, the Himalayas, they took millions of years to form. No, they, they were literally formed through plate tectonic isostases. When the ice sheets melted rapidly, the, the plate systems had too much water on them, and they pushed the Indian continent into, you know, up, up into the landmass. And this is what created the Himalayas. This is how the Dolomites were crea created in Italy. This is how Patagonia was created. In South America, these these are mountain structures that were created very fast, not not very slow. This is how even the gorge here, you know, in Oregon and all the way up into uh, BC area where where the Columbia you know river begins, that whole that whole um, area was formed very very quickly. You know, if you listen to any of what Randall Carlson's talking about, he's like this. This is a matter of you know of, you know a week if at most. And so it's fascinating that you're in the gorge and you're looking up and you're like, wow, two miles of ice, really? It's <laughs> a lot of ice. And so that was getting back to my comment earlier where I said that the, the, the oceans were, were never barriers. They were always highways. If you look at how we predict how the ice sheets used to look, we had two miles of ice thick, which is what we have on Antarctica now, literally coming down to about central Oregon across the United States and the same area across uh, Eurasia. So this would have been central China all the way through Siberia. That would have been two mile thick ice. So if you're climbing up two mile thick ice and then you're traversing say 2000 miles from, from China across to the Bering you know, land bridge and then into Alaska and then across another thousand miles of ice, how are you eating? <laughs> How are you drinking water? You know, what, what, what is your food source? Where is your potable water coming from? This just doesn't make sense. I mean, there's, there's no way that you're surviving in this terrain. I mean, it'd be like hiking across Antarctica with no supplies. I mean, there's no way you could do it. How, you know, how are you starting fires? And so realistically, they would have taken large barges in front of the ice sheets across the oceans. And so this is how we have, you know, this connection of all these cultures to South America as well. Um, in San Francisco, they found pieces of this junk, or they call it a junk, but they realized uh, when they started reconstructing it, you know, what, what it would have been. It was part of one of these convoys that were literally barges the size of villages. And they would bring all their livestock, the entire village, all their produce and they would cross the oceans and this is how a lot of these ancients got to north america and so we have this connection you know with with, with china and and even japan with native american cultures we have a connection with persia with native american cultures um, the cherokee very much are you know blood relatives of, of the persians the Phoenicians and the phoenicians 
and the Hopi and Zuni are, you know, very related to Okinawa and the uh, ancient Okinawan Japanese cultures, and even speak ancient dialect of these cultures. And so uh, I've always found this incredibly fascinating. It's like, how, how have all these cultures connected? And so this video that Julia was showing earlier is kind of, you know, an homage to that, where here we have these amazing cultures or you know, you know a, a, a combination of cultures in a sense building these caves whether it's the one in the grand canyon with buddhist and uh and south american artifacts on it or or this new one in in, in mexico thank you julia for sharing that uh that that shows you know possibly you know an, ancient romantic all the way up to modern day Olmec and 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 Central American, you know, glyphs. It's like, okay, where where is this stuff coming from? But we start to see these symbols and signs and sigils all over the world. And so, you know, is this a remnant of Atlantis where we are all one culture that was connected around the world, just like we are today? We were a unified <laughs> global civilization. Period. Seriously. Period. Yeah. There's no there's no way we can't say that we weren't. And that's why it was, it's so significant, too, to see, like, different types of gods, you know, in one location. If seeing, like, maybe there wasn't so much division in that either. Right. Mm -hmm. Very well, you have, you have similarities between the Hindu gods. You have similarities between the Hindu gods, the netters, or the energies of nature in Egypt, and the Central and uh, North, North American um, god structures of, of the Mayan and the Aztec. Very similar. They almost have the same name. Um, God, there's this amazing book that Walter was actually talking about. I'm going to grab it off my bookshelf. And yes, I do have the Sage Wall, a picture of Sage Wall in Montana up. And it's very similar to this. Uh, these are the Saskatchewan megalith runes. Um, and then this is also close by to Sage Wall in Giant's Playground. Writing on stone, Giant's Playground. Like, is this a Titan ankle bone? I don't know. <laughs> could be. Could be. Could very well be. God, where is this book? Oops. So this is in Giant's Playground. That looks like some straight-up geopolymer. Polygonal walls. That Go back. That one was in Peru. This one? No, one more. What if AI helped make huh, like that's, some that's of these ancient sites of carving it out, like printing, you know, like via laser? So the, the dead giveaway in Peru is the amount of lichen that's on the rocks because lichen in these altitudes takes a specific amount of time to grow to a specific size. And so you can literally date these rocks by the lichen on them. And so I'd, I'd be curious if there's similar aspects with, with what you're looking at here. Yeah, that's a very good point. Ooh, where's that? This is writing on stone or yeah park it's in southern alberta i gotta go back there uh this is one of the montana uh giant playground sites oops i believe this is it and this is like an astral clock at uh giant's playground in montana as you're liking yeah julie mentioned something about like uh inanna like her seeing an inanna there yeah this one's an eagle carved into the rock um, that book i was talking about real real quick it's called the last atlantis book and it, it literally connects the Hindu culture with with ancient. Um, these are the uh, Atlanteans of Tulum, where your friend was finding a lot of his artifacts. And so, yeah, super fascinating book. There's so many words that translate over into ancient Mayan and and yeah, 
from from Hindi. It's 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 really interesting. Really? Hey, there's that famous Yeah. And also connects the gods and goddesses. That was something else that I, I had realized. All these connections. Which again goes back to the cave that we just viewed earlier. I like to look I, at this place it, as like um like a gods and goddess like academy like imagine a bunch of baby gods and goddess not knowing who they are and like haven't figured it out yet and it's like like i like to look at earth sometimes it's like a recruiting <laughs> you you need to watch um jay widener's um recent uh video on the nephilim being plasma beings it's <gasps> not just about i have theories about that i have strong feelings about that so, so brilliant I, I i watched it just recently or i listened to it but i was blown away i'm like this is this is so true and it's like you know we come from the plasma field and we form physically just like if you if you look at plasma it will form a sheath like our own skin around it and so this is you know plasma being i've had an experience with a plasma being um, again yeah. i was living I was living with my friend Nick Frankie, uh, who, who my friend Nick, who lives in in Austria. We we had this house in in uh, northeast or northwest Portland. It was an old house. The house was haunted. Like it would breathe. You'd be upstairs, and all it would go, and all the doors would shutter. And even in the basement, we had like plastic tarps put up so that uh, the the motor oil that was down there wouldn't get into our computer equipment, and like the plastic tarps would form faces and whatnot. And so we're all we're all upstairs there's like six of us we're watching a movie and we had this cat that was mute the cat never meowed ever we called him black kitty el, el gato negro and he started chasing something up the stairs and was like swatting in the air and all of us looked over and there's this blue orb <laughs> floating up the stairs and the cat's trying to grab at it it, it like stops looks at us or that's what we thought and then it like flew through the wall and was gone and the cat's just sitting there clawing at it and it's like these these things are real these are you know this is this is like ball lightning it's it's a it's a plasma entity and, you were in my uh, presentation like, right you you heard what like i, how yeah, I, spoke I was. Of, like plasma light being like showing up and what they yeah. did yeah 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 and this is this is similar to my experience when i was in egypt with the ufo right the the the, the ball of plasma that the f-15s were Chasing up, up the Nile, and we're sitting there with Brian Forrester and his wife, Irene, and, and like everybody on the tour, and just looking at this thing going, what on earth are we seeing? And then the F-15s fly by, and a second ball orb just kind of, it was like orange or, you know, octarian, that, the color of magic. So it's like a bright no. white ball, but it's, it's like circulating all the colors, right? But Bernie, can you go back like five photos? Intensity. And so Keep it was going. just bobbing along as if, you know, hey, here we are. <laughs> that one or that oh, one? It, for, go forward. It looked like a line, like it was the hill. That one, yeah, I wanted to see that one. It's like an otter almost. It's got the teeth under the nose. The eyes kind of looking up to the left. <laughs> and then that. Whoa. Yeah, that's uh, this looks like Knob to... Hill, man. This, this you, you ever go up to, to Knob like... Mountain? You ever go up to Knob Hill? This looks a lot like what's up in that area. Which Knob Hill? Above Calgary. Yes. I used to bike up there. I was part of a, a Norba sponsored cycling team when I lived in Calgary, and we would, we would train up there. And it looks very similar to this. And kind of a sparse, right. rocky. What Hans? You were part of a cycling training. <laughs> this is not surprising. No, I, I used I used I used to race mountain bikes like when I was uh, a teenager. Yeah, so I toured with Nor with Norba. I, I was living in, in Calgary at the time, so it was like eleventh grade. And I this girl in my math class I thought she was hitting on me. <laughs> She's like, I see you biking to school all the time. She's like, you want to join my biking club? And I'm just like, what? She's like, yeah, I, I cycle professionally for. For a local shop in town and so i was like sure and so i signed up i got like an oakley sponsorship and a nike sponsorship for clothing so i got like a pair of shorts and a shirt that was sponsored by the, by the club I, I cycled for and then they gave me the john tomac <laughs> uh designed uh 
back in those days, um, Oakley go- uh, glasses. And so we toured um, Canmore. We did Canmore, Calgary, Red Deer, um, all the way up to Edmonton. And then we went all the way down through Montana. I did Durango, Colorado. I did Big Bear and, Mo- and Mammoth Mountain in California and, and Mount Hood in, in Washington. I, I, I did like 10 different events. I didn't fare too well, you know, but, you know, I, I averaged out. I broke... I broke my pedals off in one of one of my <laughs> one of my adventures. I had a pedal snap on me, and I was pissed when I came to the finish line. My, my my dad's taking photos of me, and I'm flipping them off. I'm like, fuck you! Yeah. <laughs> to take photos of me, I just broke my pedal, and I got mud all over me and scratches everywhere. And yeah, we had some we had some crazy adventures in Canada because they kept the fire roads open, and so you'd be bombing down this fire, and all of a sudden this truck comes around the corner. You're like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah, somewhere I'll have to share that photo with you, Julia. I have a, I have a photo. I, I made it into Mountain Bike Magazine um, and a, a magazine out of the UK as well. This we all need to see. Of me with my with my actually, I better have it by four p.m. tomorrow. No, um, I have it sitting right here. Yes. <laughs> I broke my bike in half in Nepal. Yes. <laughs> Epic. Hans does how, do snap, not how do you snap your head tube in half, man? That's this is a brand new GT that I was sponsored with, and. They wanted to send me the same bike, and I'm like, I will never set foot on that bike ever again. <laughs> Not made for Nepalese terrain. Yeah, because I, I raced a lot in the fall as well. and uh, we I, I took eighth place in that race, even though I broke my bike in half. Um, we had these guys come in from England that were, like, per, super professional, and they just – we left uh, – uh, um, what was the name? Like, uh, Cootie. Or, um, yeah, wasn't could you where did we leave from? Anyway, it doesn't matter where we left from, but these guys took off up the trail and just blew everybody out of the water. And then my friend Naranj was like third place and he was the Nepalese biker. And this guy was crazy. I mean, he'd fall off, off the trail and, you know, tumble down the mountain, pick himself up and get back on his bike and go. I mean, just super amazing, amazing bikers. These guys were, oh, like, to be I, young I was, again. So blown away with it. Yeah, I miss biking. I was I had a lot of fun doing doing races, and then I raced here in Portland for for River City Bikes for two years. So yeah, it was super super fun. And, and, you know, I got well, hey guys, cars. I'm gonna hop off, but this has been awesome. A good, I I'm yeah. super excited. You better stream from Mexico. I want it. You better live so. stream yeah, from yeah. your no, tour. No. I think so. I I wanna I wanna do an interview with with Johnny and Timothy Hogan. While I'm down there, um, if we could do, I, I've ta- told Johnny and and Tim this. It's like if we could just sit down for like thirty or forty minutes and just you know do a Q and A, that would be stellar. Because yeah. both of them have been there. I've never been there, and I'd, I'd like to pick Tim's brain on on Knights Templar activity down there. And so I think I think a good three way roundtable would be amazing for us. So. You mean five way with me and Julia co hosting? Yeah. Uh... Hey, right. All right. Okay. Well, what is what is Thursday or what is Wednesday? I think we're Wednesday the twenty seventh. We're going down there, so that that might. I'll I'll talk with Johnny and and Tim and see where they're at because we're we're both getting in there around like five p.m. So there might oh. I mean once we check in there might there might be an opportunity. Or or the day before the last day, I think, might also help our work. Because well, we're going to uh, be doing our, in our interviews. <laughs> let us know. And uh, if anyone's able to sign up for and to join you down there, how do they do it? Uh, T-E-M-E-R-Y-S at yahoo.com. Um, I think the deadline is Friday the 15th. Um, the package is all-inclusive. It's between 32 and 3600 bucks for the, for the five days everything's included all the trips all the tickets food drink everything except obviously you getting down there so that's depending on what flights you take and you get to from. like you get to talk to johnny and you know timothy oh, and, and you got yeah. and you all of that knowledge and you get to talk to you guys and ask questions and 
have that interaction. We're going to connection. we're going to about six sites, and we're we're going to immerse ourselves in the Mayan village and Mayan culture and Mayan Mayan food. So I think that's going to be super fascinating. Don't disappear. <laughs> I jump into a C note, and he's gone. Where'd he go? <laughs> you at least come back and come back so that I can join you with uh, going next year. But definitely, I mean, we, we we've got we've year. got some some adventures we need to go on and. You know, none of us are getting younger, so let's do this because I, I want to go back to Asia. I would love to take people I know to Asia and show them some of the, some of the places I've been in my life, and even Egypt and Peru. I mean, getting on a tour with the Kemet School or Horus Rising or Hidden Inca Tours with with Brian Forrester, amazing. You, you're never it, it'll change your life for sure, definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely needs to get on all of that and also over to Bosnia for the Bosnian pyramids and get both of you up to Berta so you can come check out the Medicine Hat Badlands Guardians with me again this summer. Uh, I'd and love to come back up to Alberta, man. I, I miss right? going to Alberta. Yeah. Um, uh, this June, I'm going to be going back there, exploring it more in depth, as well as the giant red balls that are right next to it uh, in the other side of the Badlands. <laughs> Uh, there in Red Rock Coulee, and then also down to Waterton National Park with uh, Red Rock Canyon, which is just wild. And it uh, it's it seems like it was the land of giants. But before you leave, Julia, what what do you have coming up? What do you have, have coming up? I have the alien event. If That's you want right. to come on down, yeah, you're going to be there. It's I will, yeah, April eleventh. To the 14th? The 15th, 14th, yeah. Correct. There's even going to be speed dating there and ecstatic dancing. So, oh, it, <laughs> oh, it should be fun. It should be fun. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. And amazing, there'll, there'll be amazing like biotechnology and biomedical technology there as well. There was amazing stuff at the last event that we were at. Um, some some really amazing people um, show up at these at these events with their products and their technology. So definitely come check it out. It'll yeah, be at the, the uh, med beds. What's that? So the bio the, the bio beds the yeah, med the beds, bio, <laughs> especially the ones like uh, if Keshi's there, the Magrav technology ones fascinating. Yeah, he spoke. He usually speaks um, at the events, but he does it like online. You know, he doesn't show up in person. He's, I guess, pretty worried about that. <laughs> it's a bit hard to get him in from Iran, and the fact that he was a former Iranian nuclear physicist doesn't really bode well in America these days. But hey, get him virtually, it's all good. Definitely. Uh, do you have a flyer for the alien event that you want to check it out at bizton b i z t o n dot com or alien event dot com or there's there's four events going on there's biomed expo there's ai expo con and alchemy event and alien event but they're all under bizton um which is kind of the the founder's website for all of these and we'll be at the sonesta los angeles airport lax so yeah definitely definitely come check it out is it loading? Did I mess it up? I think I messed it up. How did your uh, remote viewing uh, workshop go? Oh, it was awesome. Yeah, uh, we got to talk. We need to Definitely. chat. We need to chat. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I'm going to run. Have a wonderful evening. Much love. Thanks for being with us, Julia. Um. Shall we keep her going, or are you ready to, uh, shall we make it a short one tonight? What do you think, Mr. Hans? Oh, we could, unless you have any, you know, questions, comments, smart remarks. Uh, um, any any questions in the audience? <laughs> indeed. Uh, let us see. Any questions? A couple of them. You? And I guess we can keep looking at some more. Of oh, wow. What? That, that really reminds me of of uh, of Labyrinth, where where he's falling, where uh, Jennifer Connelly's falling through the the rock faces or the hand faces. There's rock faces, and they're all making their own. So this like, one's like also in the Montana Megaliths of Giants Playground. 
That's unbelievable. As well as this one, the Swan Mountain. We see the beak of the head there, and then the. Uh, oh, wow. Now I see that. How, how fascinating. Right? Like. A little, little bit of pareidolia, but there's something to pareidolia. Oh, I have to admit. And especially with the minimum of 12,000 years of erosion uh, and all of these sites out there, it's the rhino head also there in the same same giant's playground. Oh, is that a cave that goes through? That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah the eye. And they say that it's all like uh, blocks. It's constructed with blocks all throughout it. Hmm. Interesting. Got I got to go there. Another uh, face from above, I believe. Uh, that one's also in Montana. Uh, this. Let's see if my friend Sean would come on your show. He does a lot of this. Um, sure. All your research. He 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 is the one that. Oh, I knows a lot more about Mount Mount Tum Tum than I do because he's from that area. He's been there several times and. Even he even goes over the the layout of Longview, Washington, because there's the, like the whole layout of Longview, Washington is all it's super planned and it's so it's so weird. Like downtown Longview, it's such a strange, strange really? layout. Yeah, if you look at okay. a, a map, you, you'll, I'm just you'll gonna end it. it here on Julia's channels as she did not before she left, just out of respect. Hey. Hey. Oh, um. Hop on over to my channel if you still want to watch. <laughs> Bye. Bye. All right. And then I guess move on. Twitch. Hi, Mike. Oh, and we will have Hans ride back. All right. So we're looking. This one's off. Awesome. Had, had to let my cat in. <laughs> Gotta let the kitties in. Kitty Littles will meow and scratch at the door until she gets in. So, yeah. Just right? So <laughs> the animal's like, if you don't let me in, I'm just going to destroy your door. Your choice. Uh, that's actually a good question uh, from They Live. Are these on ley lines? A lot of these sites are, and that is the most fascinating point about that. I believe that is correct, too. There's I really have to go check out the backside of the Three Sisters in Canmore, Alberta. Apparently, that place let it rests on major ley line intersection, as well as uh, one time my buddy showed it to me. Like we looked on the uh, on the backside of it from Google Earth, and it showed a giant amphitheater, just like that Eagle Amphitheater, but it was all block built with crazy caves. And then they're on the top three. Why it's actually called the Three Sisters is supposedly on the backside. It's actually carved three native uh, warrior princesses, uh, one on each of the backsides of the head. So, uh, and this is the pictures we're looking at currently are between Montana and some of them are mine from Alberta. So it's in Alberta and Montana. It's interesting because in Oregon we have a mountain system that are volcanic mountains called the three sisters as well so interesting always i find there's lots of three sisters and they always have something so is this know. is this a, a reference to the to the scottish tra tragedy that we shall not name <laughs> all right good question look at this guy like is that not a more eel head it's like a fish head yeah crazy fish head like that's what I see when I see that. Stuff is and then, the, yeah, the Siberian ones. Is Sandra Phoenix asking where Sandra Phoenix, where is it in Mexico? We don't know where the cave is in Mexico currently. Yeah, we're trying to find that out. We're trying to find that out from, from Pib, Pim, Pib. Sib, Sib. Sib, Sib. thank you. <laughs> He is believing. On Insta. Oh, good old uh, Okotoks erratic, they call it. But is it something more? I When I go here, like, look, I see a face right here. Yep. And I see a lot of different faces on this guy, more than Pareidolia. And 
It's like I always lose cell phone reception even when standing in the very middle of this. It won't let me record. And it's like it's all blocked. It looks like it's just my megalithic blocks. There's a rock in the middle of my favorite waterfall in Oregon in the gorge called Wachela or Wachella Falls. It's right at Bonneville Dam. And you, you hike up about a mile to this waterfall. It's, it's like a two mile. Loop. People go there on their lunch breaks to go jogging. But in the middle of the waterfall in the, where the pool is, where the water comes down is a rock. And there it's, you, you cannot miss it. It is a face. <laughs> it is so much a face. It's unbelievable. It just sits there in the water. I'm going to have to dig up these photos for a different show. Yes, you are. I have, I have, I've taken a lot of photos of this rock over the years and it's like the face never changes and it just, it sits there and stares at you. This is Umak or Omak, Alberta, I believe, uh, known as Canada's Stonehenge, and it's been dated to at least 4,500 years ago. Really? Hmm. Yeah, giant. How big, how big is this site? I believe that is a person right there, and this is like the main center part, and then it goes out, and then there's like a whole bunch of megalithic stones around it that sit measures on i'm so saddened that in egypt they went out into the desert the western desert or eastern desert western desert yeah western desert uh to where this place called Napta playa was and it was a very very old um uh, calendar site of rocks and they decided to dig it up and move it to the nubian museum and so they have it displayed in the courtyard of the Nubian Museum now in Egypt. And it's just like, well, it's pointless now because you've destroyed <laughs> it. <laughs> you've destroyed it and moved it. And so right. nobody, nobody can align to it anymore or discover when it was built. Or, yeah, it was one of, one of the sadder things that has been done through historical monuments. But we continually see this over time. <laughs> That's uh, ridiculous. So this, I believe, is a above picture of the top of one of the mountains in Giants Playground, Montana. And then it's like these are the structures that are uh, it's showing from above. So it's like these multi dolmens that how the heck would they fall on top of themselves on top of the mountain? It's impossible. So there's there's an interesting question in the, the chat about um, sound to move stones to build the pyramids. There's a device that sits in the uh, Cairo Museum known as the schist disc. And what is thought about this is it could be a lever or a mechanism, but people have tried to recreate this in copper and other, other metals to see if it actually rotates and would create uh, a sound field or a vibrational field that would help lift some of these stones. Um, there's a really interesting thought about that. But if you start looking at all these ancient sites, they're all around water. And so water can be harnessed to, I mean, water can be sharper than diamond to cut things if it's, if it's harnessed correctly and projected correctly. Water can be used to create the energy of a pump mechanism or gear mechanism that can be used to drill or cut things at rapid speeds water pressure is super amazing and water pressure can also be used to create sound and sound waves and so this this has been an ongoing thought about a lot of these ancient sites is were they using water to create sound to create levitation very good points right there you're right not a lot of people associate sound and water but not at all no but it's yeah they're intricate Correct. And water, water is, I mean, super fascinating. Like, like I said, if you can funnel in the right pressure and the right speed or mechanism, you can cut, you can cut diamond with water. I mean, it's, 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 it's a fascinating structure. Um, this, these right here are all from writing on stone park in southern alberta and my god i'm also going back to this place it is just amazing and there's thousands year old uh carvings and petroglyphs on a whole bunch of them as well 
Um, this that wasn't doing it justice. Now we're back at Giants Playground. More dolmens. Yeah, these could be glacier erratics that are left, but that's that's a hard call. As right, we were like, talking earlier, have, having been to some of these ancient sites and seeing what they were doing at these sites, especially like the dolmen sites in England and Ireland and Scotland, it's like there's yeah. How are they lifting these things? <laughs> so here's the picture from Red Rock Cooley with um, just a portion of these ridiculous giant red balls everywhere. And so this they're, is... They're an iron deposit. Interesting. It's really interesting. Yeah, and they're on the west side of Medicine Hat, and the faces are on the east side. Hmm. Hey, it's sexy woman. No, actually, it isn't. <laughs> no, this is sage. I believe this is part of Sage Wall. Sage Wall in Montana. <laughs> I love what people call him. It's the Viking beard squid hat guy. Something. He's a something. All Cthulhu. Right. right? Cthulhu. I see a face right here as well. The shadows are right. It's the emperor. <laughs> right. Oh, there's a mimic in the clouds and the, the landscape in that last one. That was interesting. That's, yeah. The, the clouds well, turn are 90 degree. Yeah. Is it a face? Have you ever seen the uh, face of um, Machu Picchu when you turn it 90 degrees? Yes, and that's funny because we were talking about Ollante Tambo, one of my favorite sites as well, and on the hillside behind Ollante Tambo is what they call the face of Viracocha, and it's it's kind of carved into the mountainside as well. Really? Yeah, look look that up while you're while you're there. It's it's at Ollante O L L Y N T O Tambo. I suck it. I suck it just type. look up the, the face the face of Veracucha Peru and you'll face. you'll see it. Okay. Hold on. Face of how do I spell Veracucha? V E R I C U C H A, something like that. Yeah. It'll it'll pop up. You'll okay. see it. Oh. Um, <clears throat> come on. Nope, God did it not give me the right results. <laughs> oh, did it not? Gave me something <laughs> Japanese. Strange. Uh, here, I'll send you a... Currently, currently, though, we're looking at the Saskatchewan mystery rocks of why the heck can I? Is it Cypress? I think it, yeah, Cypress uh, Interprovincial Park, Cypress Hills, the Cypress Hills Park. Gotta, gotta check out that one. I went there the oh, wow. last, last spring to take a look at it, but this uh, intra-provincial park is actually 300 kilometers long, and this is on the far uh, Saskatchewan side, and I was on the Alberta side. So this summer, hopefully, I'm going to make it out here. And then this is Red Rock Cooley again. I sent you a, a link in the, okay. the chat. Perfect. Oh, that is a huge structure. How interesting. Okay, it doesn't look that big from that other photo. But that was sure. Yeah, the Omak, Alberta. It's definitely... Oh, yes, yes. I Now I remember seeing this guy. It, it's got the grain silos on the side of it, right? Jerry Willis has... Or what's known as the grain silos. Yes, correct. And so this this face it's it's very obvious when you're standing there at Oyante Tambo you 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 basically look across the valley and it's right there. I mean, yeah, it's right there, carved in. 
and then they call this the grain stores, but who knows what it actually Correct. is. Yep. What a fascinating culture. They grew corn. They had like 100 varieties of corn, same with potatoes, and same with quinoa or canoa, yo, no, no, quinoa. And they grew them all at different altitudes and under different conditions. And so this was their massive um, trade export. And so when they would meet new cultures, they'd be like, okay, where do you live? What elevation do you live? And then they'd be like, oh, well, you need this type of corn and this type of potato and this type of quinoa to grow at your elevation. And so they had all these different amazing, amazing stuff. Um, that was their gold for sure. There we go. There's other there's other photos of this, obviously, but this is this yeah. Is one of them. And that it's right on the corner, so it's like you're only seeing one half of the face from this angle. Correct. Yeah, Antitambo, one of my one of my most favorite sites of all of Peru. There's so much going on there that just does not does not compute. <laughs> right? It's the back side of it. it's yeah, it's so Ah, oh, I I gotta go. We're going. We're going next year. And this is uh, undeniable dolmen, which has two faces, one on each side. And you gotta like the main thing is you have to check out these sites during the equinoxes and the solstices for the best shadow alignments. And that's like when the sun's setting, rising, and noon sort of thing. But a definite dolmen where it's giant boulder and it's on top of a mountain ridge. And it's on top of two balancing somehow on two monolithic stones. Like, just it's wild. Also, they they live put out a fun fact: corn doesn't grow in the wild, which is true. Corn has always been one of the first genetically modified foods, even in the ancient times. And the other one, believe it or not, is the banana. <laughs> the banana. Plantains grow in the wild, but what we go to the store and buy as bananas never existed. This is completely a, a modified food, and it 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 was one of the trade foods as one of the first GMOs hundreds, if not thousands of years ago around the world because you find bananas on remote islands that shouldn't be growing unless there had been trade there. They, they don't grow like that. That's a very good yeah. point. Just uh, all of history's lies are starting to be shown. Corn and the pine cone are depicted in ancient cathedral art across Europe. Yep. Yes. Often confused from one or the other. And I have, I have an interesting thought about the pine cone and the pine nut. So I'm not a biblical scholar. I don't, you know, care too much to get into that. But we're always told, uh, you know, Adam and Eve, Eve ate the the apple from the tree of knowledge, right? And this is why they were cast out of out of, out of Eden in a sense. But they never talk about what the fruit of the tree of knowledge or the tree of life was. Well, the longest living trees are evergreens. They're always growing. They always bear fruit. Wow. Their their fruit is the pine cone and the pine nut. And the pine nut is an amazing antioxidant and a superfood. And so you always see the gods holding the pine cone. The pine cone's on the the, the Pope's staff. You know, it's, it's in all these different cultural references. And so is the pine cone the fruit of the tree of life? Just random curiosity <laughs> that you say this and it brings me pine cone pineal gland yes exactly my Correct. buddy from Kelowna shout out luke who had to uh he grabbed a bunch of pine cones and then he shook all the yellow stuff out of them into his mouth and was like it works better than viagra and i don't know but who knows it's interesting. I wish Julia was on because she did a show on Yarsa Goomba, which is these cordyceps that grow in the high Himalayas. And these things are worth more than gold. They sell for a very high amount because they're so rare. But as we know, cordyceps, you know, enhance energy and libido. And uh, I mean, we grow them in vats today, but the, the wild grown stuff in Nepal is, is untouchable compared to what you can buy on the market here. 
the cat face. Oh, wow. <laughs> right? Like uh, the straight up cat face. It's another one at this giant's playground. It's next to the eagle. I but here we have the lichen. So this lichen's two, three inches across, a couple hundred years old. That's what I'm saying. The lichen that you find at, like, oh, yeah, especially at Oyante Tambo on the stone fixtures there, you have lichen patches that are like four or five feet wide. And so, like how does the lichen grow exactly in? Like I, I somewhere I have a chart about it. I, I did a I did a piece on this when I was studying the stuff that I saw in Peru, and I'm just like, okay, if we can judge things by lichen. Uh, lichen grows at different elevations and it grows at different speeds uh, depending on what's available to it. But if you're seeing lichen patches that are a foot wide or or, or larger, you're looking at a several thousand years. Of, yeah. Of Look at this doorway, like on the opposite side. Same, same rectangle. Very crazy. Very interesting. There's a. It's funny. At Saxe Woman, there's a cave that's shaped like a penis. Um, all throughout, the, they cut it that way. But it's it's like a mushroom or a penis throughout the whole thing. And Saxe Woman was considered there's there's like fertility elements at that site. And strange, weird upside down staircases and cut marks, saw marks all over the place. And that's, really? I love these people. Oh, they were cutting this with copper saws and sand. And I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> and they were somehow cutting exactly behind it at 90 degree angles. It's not just 90 degree. Yeah, not, that's not 90, the 90 degree angle. It's there's so much friction with the plow rate of whatever is cutting this that it's it's um creating a glassy sheen or or melting of the stone so to say <laughs> this There's patina on top of it and so you you just got to stop and go well a, a, a copper saw with sand isn't going to create that much heat that it's melting the stone <laughs> but something moving at a very high plow rate would so yeah yeah very true well a lot of it looks similar to like the japanese megalis too almost with the notches right. and stuff and this is this is the thing that people don't realize when they, they're like oh uh yanaguni is a completely natural structure underwater and it's like it isn't because if you go up onto the islands outside of okinawa you see the same structures yeah exactly islands. above water. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah sorry guys <laughs> try again <laughs> it's so true like look at this one nice orb wow yeah yeah right in the center two orbs gotta wonder about that how That's does crazy. light glare like that well, as always, my friend, this has been amazing. Oh, I was like, who just came on here? Here, here. Oh, chemists <laughs> and minions. <laughs> awesome. Right? Just the minions. I'm like, on top, they're all on top of these other megalithic stones, right? Like, it's like they have a base. Every single one has some sort of base. And yeah. Human heel bone rotated 90 degrees and looks pretty. Since we're talking about pineal glands and pine needle glands in the chat, this is amazing. Um, I suggest everybody go to an amazing sound healing event where you have somebody using like the sound bowls and sit in front of them if you can for as long as you can. And the vibration coming off of these things will will crack your pineal open uh, if it's been if it's been frozen. I had the most intense pineal popping at, at one of the first sound healing events I ever went to, and so there there are ways to decalcify your pineal gland from all the horrible water, fluoride, and chlorine, and not giving medical advice, but <laughs> definitely go 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 do a sound healing because these things help activate these channels for sure two completely different types of stone how was that placed it's just right it's wild 
and that these are actually two separate rocks, apparently. And this, is it lichen or is it a drawn oh, painting or a bit of both? I don't know. It could be also patina from, from other... Oh, patina, elements, yes. Other elements within the stone, so yeah. Good call. That's that's super fascinating. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> what do we have here? Random people from montanamegalist.com. I need to go out to this site. This is really fascinating. Right? I'm, I'm Montana is so, to... so beautiful. I love Montana. Yeah. I will meet you there this year. We will meet up and do that this summer. I had to drive down to cross the border to get my visa renewed when I lived in Calgary in Montana. <laughs> right? You know, the, you know the drive I'll be taking. Oh, yeah. I do. Just, it's wow, fascinating. It's like a wild. troll. It's, and so it's it's funny, you know, this is like almost remnant of Lord of the Rings or, or The Hobbit in a sense where Gandalf, you know, freezes the trolls in stone and then, yeah. you know, Legitimate. thousands of years later we, we come across them and are like, this looks like a human. <laughs> right? There's a couple of them at this site that are like that. Um... Well, let me find it. I'm like, what the heck is that? The world's biggest shark tooth or acorn? I don't know. Fingernail. Fingernail. Yeah. Like this guy. Like, is that a half buried Gandalf troll? I'm sorry, Nibley. You need to watch out. Anyway. Yeah, let's let's close this one up. This is this Absolutely. is fascinating. Right, and like I always appreciate your time, and wow, I learned so much, and I'm glad to be part of the education as well. This is vice versa, brother Hans, and pleasure Likewise. to have you. Thank you for joining us at your time, and I look forward to hopefully joining you live from Mexico or from like Mexico. Mexico. Yeah, no, so, I'm, I'm going to try and make that happen. So. Definitely stay in touch and safe travels. And I look forward to hearing of your adventures, good sir. Thank you so much. Well, that's a couple weeks out, so we'll chat before then. But uh, yeah. All right then. Even better. Excellent. Well, and maybe, maybe we'll next episode, I can I can do kind of a, a, a Kemet meets uh, meets the Mayan meets the Peruvian aspect because that's the beginning of my uh, my lecture series that I'm not only doing. Yeah, while well, I'm in Mexico, but I'm also doing an alien, uh, I guess it would be for Alchemy event in, in Los Angeles for the same show that Julia is going to as well. And then I'm doing another show, uh, Mount Shasta, this summer for, um, I don't have that event in front of me, but if you go to the promise revealed dot net, the promise okay. revealed dot net, you will find the um, summer event. It's a camping event in Mount Shasta. There'll be a lot of speakers. Brad Olson will be there. I think uh, Laura Eisenhower will be there as well as, as many others, uh, myself included. And so it'll be a nice three, four day camping event and beautiful Mount Shasta and uh, a lot of amazing lectures, a lot of amazing workshops. That one didn't load, but I was able to get Mega Mist to load. It I should be on there. Um, yeah. And we can also go to Megalithic Mysteries finally. Back in my got that back in my control. Um, so yeah, if you scroll down. Aha, uh, upcoming events. We got this one yeah. and this one. Yep. That's the Maya Mysteries tour that we're going on. Uh, 27th through the 31st. It's going to be pretty impressive and beautiful. Can't wait. Never been to this part of Mexico, so this is going to be really amazing. I've always wanted to go see some ancient sites. Uh, Coba, uh, Nakmal is, is really on the bucket list. You as, as obviously is. filming and taking pictures of everything like oh, the yes. ever. So. Oh, oh, yes, my friend. Oh, yes. <laughs> I made the mistake. I had a very shoddy camera when I was in Peru and 
you know, technology just keeps getting better and better. And so, yeah. All right. Well, I look forward to it. And I look forward to you reviewing your pictures on a future episode with all of us here. And Definitely. We'll see you again next week then. And until then, my friend, much love. Much love. Peace. Thank you all. Thanks, crowd. Thank you so much for great questions. Have a good night. That's it.